Well, good evening, and welcome to another exciting episode of History Unsettled. The show. Hi. What? Hi, I'm uh, Misha Griffith, and this is Jerry Griffith, That's my husband. Doctor Misha Griffith, she's the smart one. I insist he says that all the time. <laughs> Doctor, could you get stuff off the talk show? Yes. Well, we're here tonight to talk to you about Reconquista, reconsidered. The idea of what happened when, in medieval Spain, uh, the Spaniards decided to take over their own country. Well, be careful. Yes. Basically, what we were saying is the Christians took over the country. The people who lived there called themselves Spaniards. Right. They've been living there for all their lives, 800 years. Mm -hmm. Many of them were conversos. So essentially, the Reconquista is really about Christian takeover of Spain right. from the Moorish Muslim influence, right. which leads me to a point that I want to make up front and be really clear about, which sure. is we're not here to trash anybody's religion. I'm mm -hmm. not Muslim. I'm not Catholic. We are looking at history. Right. We're using the historical record to look at a situation. And I think by the end of the show, you will realize that religion plays only a very small part of what we're going to be talking about tonight. And people can be good or evil regardless of their religion. Um, right. There are some really, really slimy people on both sides in this presentation. And sadly, they use religion to excuse their very uh, poor behavior. Really? Is that really? the only time in history people have no, done that? No, 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 no. They do that a lot. <laughs> take, take, take it from me. Take it from me. All right. So let's take a look about the background. How are we doing? I'm hoping our audio is good. We had a problem a couple of weeks ago. I haven't heard any complaints yet. So, oops, we've only got one viewer. Well, if anybody doesn't like our audio, please. Let us know. Let us know. All right. So let's talk about some of the background of what happened because Spain is in Europe. Right. Well, the, the history of the Reconquista is really the history of the Iberian Peninsula, what we now call Spain, because the Iberian Peninsula had been populated, well, uh, since the Ice Age, before the Ice Age, uh, there were uh, Neanderthal uh, burial areas found in Spain, certainly mm. Homo mm. erectus mm. was Tapas. up. Mm. Yeah, plenty of... <laughs> Brontosaurus uh, tapas? Brontosaurus, no, stop that. So plenty of um, generations of people lived there before we even get into the historical, anything written down as far as history. The people who do start writing down history happen to be the very first residents we know of, which uh, tended to be, well, we had both Spaniards, people who lived there, and then the people coming to take them over. Iberia, very sadly, has a very long history of having people come in and take it over. That's just part of the problem why we're arguing the Reconquista. The southern Belgium. We start with, of course, the Carthaginians. The who? They invented carts? No. Okay. The Carthaginians were the age-old enemy of the Romans, and they had... Uh, set up colonies in uh, the Iberian Peninsula, in what we now know as Spain, and had done quite a bit of training there. Uh, after the First Punic War, this is when um, uh, the Romans beat the, uh, the Carthaginians, uh, a particular warlord named Hamilcar Barca creates a military colony in Iberia. We don't know his name very much, but we do know his son's name because his son takes over the military. His son's name is Hannibal. Mm. So this is the formation of you Hannibal's- You didn't know this was going to be a Hannibal lecture, did you? Ooh, ow. Sorry. Go ahead. <sighs> you had to take a bite into that. So, so this is when Hannibal gets his army together, gets the elephants and heads to Rome. And of course, uh, he is beaten by the uh, Roman general Scipio, who beca later becomes Scipio Africanus. And Scipio Africanus and later Romans start uh, building colonies in Spain. So Spain becomes a Roman colony. It's extraordinarily important for the Romans because that's where they get olive oil. That's where they're getting wheat. They're bringing in all sorts of mineral uh, special minerals, and of course, uh, their favorite fish paste, garum, uh, 
Uh, the archaeologists in Spain have recently found garum pits. This is where you take your you take your anchovies. You take anchovies, you get them all salty, you mush them up, you put them in olive oil, uh, you put a lot of garlic in, and then you cover it up and let it ferment for a couple months. Well, let's do a That's garum. Episode. Yum. Um, and the Romans loved it and ate it on everything. So they were barbaric, weren't they? They were barbaric. <laughs> right. But uh, Rome will eventually give the Iberian Peninsula its uh, status as a Roman, not just a colony, but a Roman uh, establishment. By the first century, uh, in the current era, the uh, the Iberians have full Roman citizenship. In fact, three Roman emperors were born in the Iberian Peninsula. So that's that's pretty special. That that tells you that uh, the Romans really thought very highly. Now, before Rome, of course, goes officially Christian in, in 325 CE. 200 years before that, the Christians make it to Spain. Actually, in the New Testament, in Paul's letter to the Romans, he mentions he's going to make a trip to Spain around what we think of as about 62 CE. He unfortunately tries to take a shortcut across the Italian peninsula and gets arrested, and that's when he's murdered. Uh, he's executed. executed, sorry, executed. And so he had plans to get to Spain. Uh, but the the Christian, the Christianity that grows up in Spain is pretty different than the Christianity we think of because they were so separated and because uh, they were not in real close contract, contact with uh, Constantinople and that formation of the early Christian church, they were forming their own Christian church. There were uh, quite a few Spanish bishops, and they will get together in the year 305 CE for the first synod of Elmira. So all of the uh, uh, all of the Spanish bishops get together and start up uh, writing the canons of the church. Uh, the first group of canons they publish, about a hundred of them, almost all of those canons mention Jews. This is really the early formation of anti-Semitism in Spain, because all of these canons that these Spanish bishops come up with are banning intermarriage, with Jews, banning Christians eating with Jews, banning Jews from holding offices, et cetera, et cetera. And for those of you who are wondering why we're spending this time, we're going to see something of a rec recurring pattern. With this, this is a theme that keeps <laughs> reoccurring, both in the, in the idea of uh, people coming in and taking over Spain, and also the ideas of, uh, of religious intolerance being there. Okay, so you've now got your Christian group in Spain and right. the Roman Empire decides to fall. Oops. So who takes over? Well, it's the spaghetti colonists. The spaghetti I, colonists. I use, I use the term spaghetti colonists with my students because you look at the map. This is when the Vandals, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the uh, Goths themselves, the Lombards. That's a lot of eye makeup. The Huns. Huge numbers of different, oh, the Franks, huge numbers of different colonies from Germany, from the Russian steppes, from all over Europe, start coming into the Italian peninsula, coming into the Greek, Greek peninsula, and they come into the Iberian peninsula. And it is the Visigoths that eventually take over the Iberian peninsula, take over what we now know as Spain. But they're not a unified group, first off. It takes until your favorite guy. Oh, what are you talking about? Uh, oh, you're talking about now we're going to get, finally, we've had enough of our, so we've got a Christian group. The, the Visigoths uh, accepted Catholicism. Officially, they were Arian at first. They accepted Catholicism in, what was this, 546? 587. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's the, the king of 30 yeah, years? The, the Visigoth king of Toledo, a fellow by the name of Gert Recared, 
uh, is the one who converts everyone to the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, so 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 we have exactly a hundred and forty years before of true presence of the Roman Catholic Church in Spain. That's right. it. 587 to 711. 711. What happened 711. to 711? I can find this picture. That's why I'm staring over here. And of I course, got a great picture of what happens in 711. Well, you in go in, you get you get your sodas, you get your your popsicles, you get No, no, no. That not that 711. 711 CE. This is Tariq Ibn Zayed. The uh, mountain of Gibraltar is named after him, which is uh, basically Jamal Tariq, or Gibraltar, Gibral Tariq, which is mountain of Tariq. Um, in fact, uh, this is the currency of Gibraltar. This is a five pound note. I didn't know this until recently. Gibraltar was technically part of the United Kingdom, prints their own money with a pound that exchanges a pound for a pound. So that's an image of Tariq, Tariq bin Zaid, Ibn Zaid. We don't actually know what he looks like, but yeah, it sounds good. That's a fortress that's in Gibraltar today that he built. Uh, now, was he a, a Moor or was he a Berber? Well, we don't know. There are some people who have theorized that he was actually African, uh, okay. black. Like he might African have been American. black, yeah. Well, there's that... a lot of inconsistency there, but we know that he was a slave right. who had been freed, that he traveled independently, mm -hmm. he had built up an army, and that he was not authorized to take over Spain. Mm -hmm. He basically was doing it on his own, said, let's go uh, see what happens. And Spain fell apart before him. So right. now he's a Muslim leader. Right. He comes in and he takes over. And I've got a little map of his conquest. But essentially, he comes from the bottom and just goes across at Gibraltar, spreads it's all the very, way. very short distance, a little, nine little miles. nine miles straight. It's very easy to get across. Nine miles, travels all the way up to uh the Pyrenees goes into what is today France, um, just conquers this huge amount of stuff while he's in the service of the Caliph of Damascus. Not, not, not a bad job for a freelance uh, conqueror. Now, one of the things that we've got is you may notice that Damascus is a long way from Spain. Damascus is all the way on the other side of the Mediterranean. Now, uh, up Spain. until uh, 400 and something or other, mm -hmm. uh, Spain was technically part of the Roman Empire, which was had headquarters in Byzantium, Constantinople. Today right. we call it Istanbul. Right. Constantinople. Noble. All right, sorry. Anyway, so it wasn't any faster to administer um, Spain from Damascus than it was That's from... From Constantinople. So, so... Both of which was very difficult to do, which meant that, you know, people who were in Iberia were pretty much on their own. It took six months, supposedly, to get a message from the caliph to, to, to Spain and back. And when a message came, went, in this case, from Tariq to the sultan and back, it said, mm -hmm. what the heck are you doing in Spain? Get out of there! <laughs> <laughs> Tariq and um, his political overlord were recalled immediately to Damascus. We mm -hmm. don't really know what happened to him after that. We had a lot of turmoil in the region of Spain. A right. lot, a lot of upset, but still Moorish conquest. One of the reasons they think that Tariq was able to take it so fast was the Visigoths were very weak. And they were fighting against each other, and the Jews were really angry at the Visigoths. Yes, the the Jews that were still in Spain, who had been living under the Visigoths and the whole uh, uh, Synod of Elmira canons, they were quite willing to help the Muslims conquer the Spanish. And we're not the talking about a handful of people. There was a, a Jewish community 20, in Spain. 30, yes, yeah, from, from the beginning. Least. So this is one of the reasons. So anyway, so Tariq is recalled. You have a little scurrying. You have a lot of right. stuff going on. And then we've got the Red Wedding. <laughs> yes. Would you care to tell us about the Red Wedding? I thought you were going to tell us well, about Well, okay, but I was going to pull up a picture. But essentially... Oh, okay. um, Damascus, there's a... Damascus, okay, I'll, let me tell you a little bit about it. Damascus was the capital of the Umayyad dynasty. What a name. Yes, I know, great, great name. The Umayyad dynasty had taken much of the Middle East. They had gone all through North Africa, and with the help of Tariq, they're now up in Spain. Hello. Um, but they could not hold everything together. And they were challenged by a separate dynasty, the Abbasid the dynasty. The Abbasids were so named because they were followers of Abba. 
It's true. No. It is true. They were followers of a wise man named Abba. They were the Abbasids. And they, you are the dancing queen. Young. Hey, we're here all week, folks. It better not be. <laughs> so the Abbasids have a series of wars against the Umayyads. Umayyads. Dynasty. Umayyads and Abbasids. A lot of vowels in this part of the world. They have a lot of wars. The Abbasids have pretty well taken over, but there's still a lot of Umayyad princes running around. Sure. So they decide to invite them all to dinner. Yes. The Abbasids decide to gather all the princes together for a dinner. And they serve them wine. I don't know if they did wine or not. They're Muslims. Uh, no, no, no. They're Muslims. They, 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 they serve yeah. them a number of things, and then they basically chopped off their heads. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Eighty of them were slaughtered. And according to the story, and this is such a good story that I almost wonder if it's true, this one gentleman managed to escape. His name was Abd al-Rahman. Or Abdul al-Rahman. Yes. And he escaped from Damascus and went all the way to Spain. Runs, goes all the way, takes him three months, goes all the way across North Africa and makes it to Spain. Where he establishes himself in Cordoba and says, you know, Cordoba, Cordoba sorry, you know, I'm one of the Umayyads. I'm in charge here. And so he basically sets up uh, his, his own uh, kingdom or basically an emirship. Uh, actually, no, it was a, uh, that, not, that's not, the, that's not the right map. Sorry. Nope. No, sorry. That, that's coming up. Anyway, he sets up a kingdom and he is a very effective leader. He, after he gets there, he rules for 30 years. He is, he is basically takes what Tariq had done. Uh, it was close to a hundred, uh, close to 50 or 60 years before that. And he builds on it. He uh, uh, he consolidates the victories. He gathers a big enough army. There's nobody from Damascus to stop him. And so he starts to create basically his own dynasty. And he builds this. Oh, yeah. In the city of Cordoba, after he has gained all of his victories, he will create one of the world's largest and most beautiful mosques, patterned very much after the mosque that is in Damascus. This is called the Mesquita. It's in Cordoba. This is video we actually just took last week. Yes, we're showing you our vacation pictures. Yeah. Deal with it. <laughs> it is still there. It is still something that the Spaniards love. It is an amazing piece of art. They also built a church in the middle of it, but that came later. Right yeah. now, we're still talking about the establishment of Ar Rahman and his building of basically, uh, he didn't call it a caliphate. I believe, I'm not sure what his word he was. He called for. it, he was an emir. He did not call himself so an a okay. caliph. He was an emirate. Um, he will uh, go on to build the mosque, build up the city of Cordoba as his capital. Cordoba will become the center of learning, uh, the center of arts, the center of his government. Oh, yes, and very, and very advanced. Dynasty. Within 100 years, it was the most advanced city outside of largest, Asia. One of the largest cities, probably the largest city in Europe. It might have been even been bigger than Byzantium, certainly bigger than London or Paris or Rome. So this is the start else. of the golden age of more Spain. Right. The goal in which, uh, in which the money that's coming in uh, is paying for an amazing amount of in infrastructure. During this time, uh, Abdul al Rahman the first, and then his descendants build mills, build irrigation uh, systems, build bridges, or uh, 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 add to the Roman bridges that were there. They add to a lot of the Roman stuff that was there. Uh, and they basically create a library of probably, uh, he and I argue about this, around... One four, source yeah, says 400,000. 400, Other sources say volumes. that's not possible because that's so many books and books were all hand copied at this time. Yes. But that's just not realistic. And it, so there's people it, who say, you're fudging your numbers. Come on. Uh, except that we do have a record of the scribes, not just any particular group of scribes in Cordoba, women scribes. Women were trained to be the scribes there. They had about 60 of them. 
they were on the payroll, and they were making copies. There's also constantly. no paper. Now, the there, largest they all, library, paper. largest library in Christian Europe this time was in St. Gall in Switzerland. It had 620 some odd volumes. We. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so, so I'm oh, going to skip forward a little bit. Because okay, we're you want to just to talk wanna, about talk about the history. All right. Well, no, actually, I want to jump forward a little bit because what happens is Mr. Rockman and his immediate descendants run into trouble with this guy, Charlemagne. This is Charlemagne. Charlemagne basically looked at Europe and said, "Um, these guys are getting awfully close. In fact, they made it over the Pyrenees. They made it into France." And so we've got Charlemagne starts setting up buffer zones. He builds what's called the Marca Hispania, which is a buffer zone. After, after Charlemagne leads troops and conquers Barcelona, Barcelona, if you want to be technical, um, he, he creates this buffer zone. Mm -hmm. And essentially, you've got really within 15 years of Tariq's taking of Spain, you've got the Christians Reach taking right. portions. Well, right. well, technically, the first case was 17, 726, so that's really 15 years. You've got the beginning of the Reconquista. So the Reconquista, in some ways, is the longest war in history. It ran from <laughs> 726 it's, until 1492. 1492, yeah. Um, and but, but not with continuing running Yeah, back. actually, no. yeah, it was pretty <laughs> intense. But we're here tonight to talk about the Reconquista itself. We're going to come back to some of the glories of life in Cordoba, if time permits. But I wanted to talk for just a second about the Reconquista, which was a series of battles, um, a lot of really impressive stuff, uh, which led up until, well, let's, let's, let's okay. We've got to real briefly talk about the Amarids. Yes. And the, uh, I was, go ahead. Um, Even though Abdul al-Rahman's grandson? Yes. Abdul al-Rahman III, uh, considers himself, calls himself a caliph. He creates the caliphate. He declared independence from Damascus and declares himself in, right. a caliph. Yes. Because in, in the Islamic tradition, there can only be one caliph. And so he declares himself caliph. And so here you have the Muslim presence in most of Spain is unified under one guy, uh, the caliph. And this is like the last time for many hundred years, we're going to see Spain unified under a single individual. After kind of al-Rahman <laughs> III, uh, his uh, area is going to start dissolving. This golden age does not last. Well, he's sadly. Umayyad. They're followed right. by the Almoravids, right. who were a group that came up from Spain. No, nope. Came up from Africa, sorry. They were the, the Almoravids were from were Berbers from Morocco from Marrakesh was their um, was their capital. They see that the caliphate uh, becomes weakened after Al Rahman the Third is gone, uh, and so they come to take advantage of that. Uh, the uh, Almor, uh, sorry, I can never pronounce their name. Um, please help. Almoravid. Amoravids, thank you. They are much sterner in terms of their fundamental ideas of Islam. And so... They also, when, when was it the first one? Uh, da, 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 yep. 976, you've got mm -hmm. this gentleman who was actually, this is Al-Mansur. Now, this is confusing. There's two guys with very similar names that pop yeah. up. But Al-Mansur was never actually the sultan or the caliph, he was a vizier, but he sort of pushed other people away. And he basically said, we're going to get rid of these Jews in here. We're going to get rid of these Christians. And this library has got to go. And yes. he burned most of that library. Yes, he's he's responsible for burning the library, most of the library at Cordoba. Uh, some of it does, um, does survive so that it can be burned by somebody else a little bit later. Uh, so one of the things that we're learning here is we were told some of the stuff, and we're going to come to this in mm -hmm. a minute, implies that this was a time of peace and harmony. Right. But the golden age. It's called uh, the, 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 under the al rahmans under the caliphate, under the uh, emirs of the Umayyad, they consider that the golden age of uh, the uh, Islamic uh, rule of Spain. There were streetlights in Cordoba. Yes. 
I, well, I was going to. I'm going to talk about that when we talk about later, but let's keep going with the history. We're, we're stuck. Well, okay. We've got a lot of history and we're trying to get through all this and, and I'm trying to put stuff into perspective, but essentially, so we're, we were back there with our friends. Um, this is the Caliphate of Cordoba. This is essentially the area that they controlled. You can see the little bit of Africa, also the uh, islands off there, off to one side. Um, so Abed Rahman declared himself as caliph. He was followed by Al-Mansur, who destroyed the library. Um, and then he was utterly ruthless to the Christians. In 10, 1008, Muhammad II took over and they decided to destroy the palace. And then we've got something called the Taifa period. Pretty word. Yes. What does Taifa pretty. mean? Uh, I forgot. I think it means nobody gets along. Yeah, <laughs> nobody gets along with anyone. Um, there's another group of Berbers that come to capture uh, Cordoba. They kick the Jews out again. Um, now, are we talking now about the, uh, the next guys, the Al Almohads? Yeah. Because the Almohads were, they were actually led by, I've got this gentleman's name here because his name was, uh, da, 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 da. first the Almohads. Mohammed II? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there is, it, it, it's, uh, Ibn Tumart, he led the Almohad. He believed that it was his destiny to reform Islam, mm -hmm. that Islam had gotten out of control, that it was too decadent, there was too much secularism. And this is something we see in Christian societies and Muslim societies. I've read about it in India, that you've got a golden age, but you've also got with that a flowering. Right. And there was a lot of stories about the harem at Cordoba. Right. And there were stories about the martyrs of the harem. And, and allegedly, um, Arachman III, uh, executed a gentleman known as St. Perfectus because St. Perfectus was a handsome 17-year-old who refused to have sex with him. Now, this may be true, I don't know, but the other thing is, if you wanted to spread scandal, you talked right. about being gay back then. Right. So anyway, um, this gentleman, uh, the first of the Berber elites, his but, feeling is that it is, of the Almohads, believes it is his duty to reform Islam and to purify. Right. Now, so Cordoba is essentially somewhat laid uh, to waste. It's quite a bit of damage done. And so the power structure moves essentially to another city, the city of Granada, which is uh, quite a bit to the uh, east of Cordoba. By the way, we should note that we have early on here, and you can see the C is for Castile above the, the Almohads. This is essentially, they had pushed it down, and this is starting with the reign of uh, Ferdinand III. Ferdinand III comes and before Otto Ferdinand the II, which is right. terribly confusing. Yes. Um, but essentially what happens here is that uh, Muhammad II, we were back a little bit in the Taifa period, hires a bunch of Christians to help him take over Cordoba and drive right. various people out, reestablishes right. it. Then we got the Almohads coming in. We had the Crusades launched. Uh, the Pope authorized a crusade. The Crusaders come in, which means that you come in if you'll help free Spain. You get blessings and special right. dispensations and so on. This was 30 years before the actual first crusade of the Holy Land, was there was a crusade launched into Spain. It failed miserably. So there was a military attempt in, what is this, 1043? Yes. 1043. I believe. To okay. take over to take over uh, the Islamic portion of Spain. Okay. Now, however, by the way, just um, when the Almohads come in, one of the things they said was no more Dimini's. Dimini was the term for somebody's D H I M M I, probably Dimini or something, but anyway, for a person who is not a Muslim living in a Muslim land. Mm -hmm. And they were allowed to exist under much of the Golden just, Age. Yep. They had to pay something called the jizya, which was an annual tax. Right, and that tax allowed them to worship as they wanted to, but for the most part. The, the section of the Quran and a couple of hadiths talk about the people of the book, mm -hmm. which has been interpreted to mean that Muslims... Abrahamic religions. Yeah. They actually now extend it, in modern thinking extends it to Jains, but basically, and this is something that applies to this day, mm -hmm. Most Muslim interpretations say that they are obligated to protect Christians and Jews. Right. That, you know, you can go heal, kill them. Yep. Polytheists all you want, but you're supposed to protect them. But uh, under the Almohads, they kind of said, this is not working out so well. This is impure. And for the record, they were always second-class citizens. 
They yes. had their own courts. They had a lot of liberties. And when we talk about this progressive society, mm -hmm. we, we, we forget they were still second class. It was uh, third class. The Jews were second class. The Christians were third class. And then on the bottom, you had the sla slaves. Oh, yeah, we still had slaves going on. Well, what about women? Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, don't get me started. Okay. Now, the Almohads were a very curious group because at the time that they first came to power, there were two incredibly wise and incredibly important thinkers living in the city of Cordoba. We don't know if they actually knew each other, but no. their names to scholars are very familiar. One of them was Jewish and one of them was Arab. Mm -hmm. The Jew was named Maimonides, mm. Moses Maimonides. And he wrote some very important books and was a very important interpreter of the Mishnah, of the Torah. Uh, he was known as a rationalist. He went away from the more mystical elements of the Kabbah and went towards a more rational approach to the ethics of Judaism. And he wrote some really interesting books, in, including the, the book with the greatest uh, title ever written, The Guide to the Perplexed, um, in which he spells out rational ideas about uh, Jewish ethics. Yes, he was a believer in rationalism, which was rather unpopular with a lot of Jewish thinkers at the time. Right. But he was eventually, they said, you're Jewish, you get out of here. Right. His contemporary was a man named Averos. Mm -hmm who was a Muslim. I don't have a picture of his. I thought I did. You, I'm didn't, sorry. you didn't have a picture. Okay. okay. Um, and Veros was, um, was a court physician. He was an astrologer. He was an astronomer. He was also very, very interested in something that the Islamic uh, leadership was not at all interested in, and that was Aristotle. Yes. Um, Averroes brought back the teachings of Aristotle. In fact, we mentioned him briefly, if you can listen right. to the audio on our show on Aristotle, right. on Aristotle. Bad audio. Right. but he was, he was one of the most important thinkers of the Middle Ages because he brought back rationalism, the thinking of Aristotle in a way that, that opened it up and did make it to Western Europe so that it was part of the influence on Aquinas, on uh, Peter right. Abelard and so on, was Averroes. Very important man. This was the sultan at the time. His name was Yaqib al-Mansur. This is a later painting, obviously, because it looks like a lot of these paintings are later. And, of course, Muslims often aren't allowed to have pictures painted anyway. But he basically chose to protect Averroes and chose to drive out Maimonides and the other Jews. Um, he, However, well, let me, let me put one very important part. It wasn't just the fact that these guys were thinking and writing books. They were teaching. They were uh, copying other people's books. They were translating books from Greek to Latin to Hebrew to Arabic and all these uh, different translations back and forth. And, of course, um, your modern uh, archivists have a rule. Lots of copies keeps stuff safe. So they're making lots of copies of these books and they're getting out into the uh, hands of other people who collect books, other literate people, etc. Okay, now at this time, we've got warfare going on up north. The Christians are starting to encroach. They're going back and forth. We're up to around 1200, just to give you a little sense of what we're talking about. A lot of things going on, a lot of battles and uh, Yaqub al-Mansur says, you know, uh, this is not cool. He does start going on pogroms against Christians in particular, mm -hmm. and he gathers up large groups, chains them together in blocks of 50, and sells the Christians to Africa as slaves. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we have white people from Europe being sold to Africa as slaves. Yes. A little, little, little reverse whatever there. Yes. Okay. Um, so it was a pretty harsh time. He was pretty harsh guy at this, this point. And around this time, Fernando III is really starting to gain in power. By now, for, Fernando III yes, go ahead. is a Christian from where? Mm, he's from Castile, I believe. Castile. He, uh, is, he is the king of the kingdom of Castile. Spain in the north, the areas not controlled by the Christians, is actually broken up into several different kingdoms, several different Christian kingdoms, 
Portugal, Navarre, Castile, Aragon. Um, and these guys are cannot get along. Um, <laughs> they are constantly fighting amongst themselves for land. This is a, a period of time in Europe where we're going a little bit away from the feudal system of the little warlords and the little lords and, and nobles and going to more centralized government. And so kings and queens uh, are trying to get larger and larger pieces of land, more and more followers, trying to create larger centrally controlled governments. And this is true in Spain as well. Um, except that Spain is these five different kingdoms with the uh, Islamic kingdom, uh, pardon me, the Islamic Emirate. At, and you can south. see Castile is gaining good ground. And uh, Ferdinand III basically takes Cordoba, which, as we said, was the capital of, was the capital of, of Moorish Spain. This is another picture. There are statues and paintings of Ferdinand III all over Spain today because, of course, he was taking over and, and doing yes. things. One of the things that happened with Fernando III, though, was he made a deal with Sultan Muhammad ibn Alamar, who basically promised to help Ferdinand take the city of Seville, which is very southern end of Spain, critically important, hugest city in Spain. Right. One of the city larger in, okay, cities okay. in Spain. Yeah. In exchange for being allowed to have Granada. Right. And so now you've got moving to Granada, the Alhambra, the last vestiges. But this was through a deal that we've got Muslim soldiers helping Christians mm -hmm. conquer Seville from other right. Muslims. Right. So obviously there's not a monolithic entity of Muslims throughout no. this region. So, so the, the Muslims have broken up into smaller groups and Spain is, of course, broken up into smaller kingdoms, which means that they're playing one against the other. One group is selling the other group out. Uh, Muslims are being allowed to, to control certain areas by paying off their neighbors, their Christian neighbors. Uh, there's quite a few Christian kingdoms at this time that are making very good money being paid off by Muslim warlords. Another thing which Yaqub al-Mansur, I spent too much time reading about him, I think, yeah. did was he becomes convinced that Okay, so Christians and Jews were told, convert to Islam or right. leave. Easy. A lot of people converted to Islam, and it becomes convinced that they're not sincere in their conversions. So he requires the Mozarebs, which are the, uh, actually, Mozarebs are Christians, sorry, the converted, anyway, do I have any for them? No, the converts to wear funny clothes. They yes. limit their rights. So mm -hmm. unless your grandfather was a Muslim, you don't really count as a Muslim in his society. Right. So around this time, we decide people are going to go to Granada, as we talked about, and we have the founding of the Nasrid dynasty. Let me pull up a map the Nasrid dynasty is the last of the Muslim dynasties on the Iberian Peninsula. They are actually it's the green area down here. Arabians. So you have had Umayyads, you have had Berbers, you have had Moors, you have had all sorts of different uh, groups come in, but. The Nazarids are unique because their family is no, not only Arab, but they claim their dynasty is defended from, de descended from one of the, uh, the compatriots of Muhammad. So they have an extraordinarily high position in the uh, Islamic dynasties. So they eventually take over the city of Granada and the area known as Granada. Granada is an olive oil producing area. Uh, when you go there today, you drive through mile after mile after mile of olive orchards. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It is also served by two very important ports, Malaga and Almira. Uh, and those ports are crucial for the uh, olive oil to be shipped out to other places in North Africa where the olives don't grow, uh, et cetera. So Granada is a, a fortress, the a fortress Alhambra, high on a, on a hill, uh, but it also depends on these two, two ports, and that's very important to know. Okay, so around this time, 
you know, so we've got basically the Moors are pretty much trapped down in this one region. It's a good sized region yeah. in southern Spain. They've been driven completely out of Portugal. And we haven't talked enough about Portugal because the history is slightly different. Right. But this is where I can first say the Reconquista in some ways in Portugal was a good thing. Mm -hmm. Because Portugal suddenly was no longer fighting internally. Portugal has enough small areas that the borders were relatively stable. And Portugal was able to start exploring. Yes. Start getting out there. You've got Prince Henry the Navigator. Prince Henry the Navigator takes over and starts using, uh, ironically enough, things like the Astrolab, which was invented in Cordoba, uh, and starts using these instruments, magnetic compasses, portolani, which are important maps, and of course the Astrolabs uh, to navigate. The idea was to navigate south around Africa. This is his big desire, is to get uh, Portuguese sailors around Africa. And of course, they didn't know how big it was. They had no idea how far south they had to go to get around Africa so they could get back up to India and then eventually to the Spice Islands. That was their dream, to get to the Spice Islands and control that. And they will. The Vasco da Gama uh, and other sailors will make it all the way to Malacca, or the Spice Islands, and they're going to start bringing back those little bits of dried luxury we know as cloves, cinnamon, uh, peppercorns, all of these spices that are not found in Europe and that make life worth living. <laughs> Especially if you smell so bad in the Middle Ages. Exactly. <laughs> so Portugal established a spice route to Asia. This is a, a, an important thing which I didn't quite understand. So Portugal has the spice route. We've still got a conquest going on in Spain, but you've got this lady. Oh, boy. Not exactly a beauty queen, is she? Uh, but she is a queen. That is Isabella. Isabella. You're not going to make a joke about she could borrow one of my chins? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. They were seeking a trade route to find chins. <laughs> right. Isabella comes to power in Spain, in Castile. She marries Prince Ferdinand of Aragon. Okay. So you've got to merge these kingdoms. So all of a sudden, instead of having two of the biggest kingdoms uh, fighting against each other, they're now married. They can work together. But they can't. Isabel's claim to the throne is really kind of flaky. Tenuous. And so in order to keep... The king of Portugal was married to a woman who had a slightly better claim to the <laughs> claim of yeah. crown of Castile than That's Isabella. But in order to cooperate, Isabella promised that the Spaniards would not sail south of the Canary Islands. Yes. And so if they wanted a route to Asia, going around south of Africa, as we showed you on that map, was really not a practicality. So, but let's finish the Reconquista first. Okay, but this is important because right. what we're, see we're seeing the development of technology and the development of reasons for wanting to do things. For, for but, actually unifying kingdoms. But first, kingdoms. the Reconquista. See. All right. So we've got, we're down to Granada. We've got the last siege of Granada. If I got a map of Granada somewhere, uh, I'm showing you the palace here. This is the Alhambra. Um, no, you don't have it up. That's the Alhambra. Um, yeah. Talk about the Alhambra while I find a map. <laughs> the Alhambra uh, was started on, I think it was a Roman, um, Roman, ruins of a fortress the romans of course were great at bringing in water and so they're the source of the water in the middle of this desert area of granada the source of the water comes from about four or five miles away coming down on aqueducts the uh the nasserids rebuild the aqueducts and turn uh the alhambra into the most safe and beautiful of the fortresses, I think, almost anywhere in Europe. Okay. So around this time, we've got uh, the, the green area here, which is the Granada, is basically uh, agreed to um, be a tributary state. They're spending money to these two beauty queens and beauty king. That's uh, 
Ferdinand and Isabella. They are sending regular tribute money. They are cooperating, but there's still skirmishes going around. In 1331, which is 100 years before I was talking about it, I forgot mm -hmm. to mention this, uh, the Moors uh, battled for Granada. It's the first record in history of anybody using cannonballs. Using cannonballs. Yes. So anyway, but that's somewhat irrelevant. So what happens is in 1374, the emirate of Granada starts mm -hmm. growing and prospering. You get a gentleman by the name of Ibn al-Khatib, very important scientist, philosopher, historian, and physician. He came up with a theory that said plague, which was bothering the rest of Europe by 1374, mm -hmm. was actually spread by some sort of contagion that may be in people's clothes or may sure. involve physical contact with people, really ahead of the curve. However, he also... Um, had other theories, and people said, you know, your medical theories really aren't consistent with the Koran, and mm -hmm. so they had him suffocated. Yeah, uh, anyway. yuck. Okay. Anyway, so, on to the Recon... Well, the real, the, the, the concerted Reconquista. The last part of the Reconquista. So the Reconquista has been going on for quite a while. This gentleman is known as Mohammed XII. The uh, Spaniards called him Boabdil oh. because they couldn't pronounce Mohammed, I guess, or I don't know. But he was the emperor of Granada, but he did something stupid, which was he decided to send a raiding party into um, Cadiz, I uh, believe it was. Anyway, and he grabs a group of Christians, hauls them off, and sells them into slavery. Make a few bucks. Um, Ferdinand and Isabella have another advantage going for them, which is that the largest areas of Spain aren't fighting with each other. Right. And they like to fight, so what can they do? Let's get Let's start fighting the Muslims. And unfortunately, Boabdil or Mohammed the Twelfth give them ample reason to attack. They've just, you know, he just formed a raiding party and had done some raids. So they now have a reason in 1487 to start uh, essentially uh, trying to take over the rest of Granada. And they do it rel relatively quickly. They do it relatively quickly. They do it by taking the ports, the port of Malaga and the port of Almira. This essentially cuts Granada off from any help. Now, the uh, emir in Granada is going to send for help to places like uh, uh, to, the, to the Berbers down in Morocco. Well, the Berbers down in Morocco had been making a killing selling grain to <laughs> Ferdinand and Isabella to feed the army. So they're not interested in helping out with, um, with uh, the Emir of Granada. So we're seeing they're, this pattern over and over again, again which yeah. is that it's not about religion, it's about money, right. it's about power. It's about money, it's about power. And finally, one thing that Ferdinand and Isabella start investing in is the latest gadgets of the time, Canon. They go in and buy something like 180 cannon. They hire a bunch of Burgundian cannoneers to run these cannons, and they surround the Alhambra with cannons. Uh, your fortress is very good against knights. It's very good against armies. It's very good against, you know, most siege techniques of the regular Middle Ages, but bring in cannons, game over. All right. We are, by the way, 50 minutes into this show, and it's about time we started talking about our about less history and more about, about right. the real issue here, which is the Reconquista and what happens. So essentially, as I showed you in that last image, this is... Uh, Oops, that is not the image. This That is feedback. That Nothing should be the image. Feedback. That's the image. This is a painting of the surrender of Mohammed II, Mohammed XII, Boabdil, to uh, Ferdinand and Isabella. This is in January 2nd, 1492. It is still a holiday in this yes. part of, you know, basically. In, this part of, in that part of Spain. Okay. So. They basically take over, and now what are they going to do? This is where I think that some of the positive aspects of the Reconquista may have happened, because suddenly Ferdinand and Isabella don't have any more wars to fight. Mm -hmm. They've got a unified thing. Now, technically, they did go on into Africa. They took the port of Oman. That's, that's beyond that, and then they lost it. Right. But 
one of the first things that they start doing is we got to deal with this trade problem. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? Um, the Portuguese are beating us going to south, the east yeah. and south. Maybe we can find another way. What if we go, go west? west? And they, uh, you know, obviously, I'm going to show you a very famous picture. They hire this uh, Chris guy, this uh, Genoese sailor. Um, maybe I won't show it to you. Um, they hire a Genoese sailor. Um, it's actually part of three, the Columbus brothers, but two of them got busy. <laughs> this is actually true. There's a, a little backstory there. Um, my pictures did not come through. Um, and, and they, so if you wonder about the value of the Ray Conquistas, would you like some potato chips? Oh, they're from the New World. Oh, you can't have, yes. don't worry, corn chips. Corn. No, they're from the New World. Would you like some syphilis? No. Okay. But the opening up of the New World, now for the Native Americans, not such a good idea. Isabella yeah. actually disapproved of mistreatment of the natives. Columbus was brought back in chains yeah, after but, his third voyage yeah, for but, beating us enslaving Indians. You, you, can, you can make all sorts of decrees that you want about don't be mean to the Native Americans, but when your germs smallpox get you know into a population of people who have absolutely no uh immunity, uh, yes. immunity to the disease it wipes them out and there are certain estimates of close to 80 to 90 percent of the native americans uh that were around during columbus's time and a little bit after uh died of diseases okay. so it was it was a big thing but what about in Spain? What happened in Spain? They reunified the country. Well, one of the interesting things that happened was a gentleman by the name of, let's see if this, Antonio, come on here, where are you, Antonio? Antonio de Nebija came in 1492, got an audience with Queen Isabella and says, I have just invented the grammar book. This is the first code for how to write a language other than Latin or, or Arabic. And this will be used to inspire language and arts, and a golden age of art and culture. Mm -hmm. Isabella said, that's stupid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I already know all the words. <laughs> she was a politician. But, oh, if we're going to talk about positive aspects of the Reconquista, yeah. let's pause for a moment while Misha gives us a list of all of the prominent female rulers of Muslim Spain. I got nothing. All right. So we did get the rise of Isabella. And Isabella right. was the first powerful woman ruler in Europe, really since Cleopatra. One of the, one of the first. I say, I, I tried to put yeah, it as right, right. She was really one of the first. She was an inspiration to her own granddaughter, right. uh, which was a uh, little bit of Mary Tudor. Yes. And, of course, Mary's sister, half-sister Elizabeth, was right. a phenomenal ruler. Right. So one of the things that we have is we see a place for women. Was it a breakthrough or was she an abnormality? An, an, was she, an she was an ambitious woman who got the opportunity to run with it. But I don't even think that the Moors would have allowed a woman in power no matter how good her connections were. You can't find me. They had 800 years. No, no, I, no. So, okay. That is a form of progress. That is one of the potential positives right. of the Reconquista is we've got a place for women in this society. Mm -hmm. And she was a just woman. She improved the police system. She reformed the economy. Can you name one bad thing she did? Yeah. March 31st, 1492, the Alhambra Decree. I wasn't expecting the Spanish Inquisition. Yeah. Uh, basically, <laughs> Jews get out. Uh, or convert. They were allowed to convert. Yes, um, they gave them that option. Uh, they could convert or they could go into exile. And by the way, you can only take your personal position, possessions, any property you owned, any jewelry you had, or any money you happened to have. That had to stay with the uh, Spanish crown. Thank you very much. Um, but they promised, one of the deals they made with Boab deal was right. Muslims could practice their religion right. in freedom indefinitely right did that and work out no that does not work out um they are forced into conversion as well in 1502 they had a little bit of a squaffle they felt their rights weren't being taken and so and they had a, something of a riot and, and ferdinand actually said um 
had your chance. Yep. <laughs> Get out. Yeah. So so by 1502, the the Muslims are all gone. So actually, they weren't gone. There were massive conversions. Now all massive conversions. Okay, this is critically okay. important. This is critically important because this the 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 Spanish crown starts being a little bit afraid of these converts. They don't think they are actually converted. We saw that happen 400, 200 years earlier with yeah. Cordoba, with right. the Christians converting right. to Islam. So now they're not quite believing that these Jews and these Muslims are really right. sincere and Christians. So, and, and so the Pope and Ferdinand and St. Dominic come up with the brilliant idea the Spanish Inquisition. Yes, the Spanish Inquisition was uh, tr was essentially questioning these uh, converts to see if they were in fact uh, truly sincere about their conversion. And the only way to make sure is to torture them. Well, torture was never ever used as a punishment. It was not a punishment. It was it was a way to make sure that they got work. the truth. You found that if you tortured people enough, you found out that they were all lying. It was amazingly yeah. effective. It was amazing. Okay, estimates on how many people died in the Spanish Inquisition are really inconsistent. Yeah. There are stories of as many as 30,000 as few as 3,000. Yeah. Um, or even fewer. We know that according to some records of those subjected to the Inquisition in Spain, approximately two tenths of a percent were actually executed. Right. The vast so, majority were tortured. Yeah. They confessed. They mm -hmm. did penance and probably for the rest of their lives. Yeah. But um, and there were still plenty of them that were done. Now, uh, in 1504, this is just an interesting trivia. You have the issuance of something called Oran Fatwa. Mm -hmm. Oran Fatwa was a rule made by various imams that said if you're a Muslim. And they're going to kill you. Mm -hmm. You can pass for Christian. Yeah. You can eat pork. You can charge interest. You mm -hmm. can do all of these things that Muslims aren't supposed to do. Right. Um, and so you did have both Jews and Muslims living under the radar for a while. Today in Cordoba, there's a very good museum, the Sephardic Jewish Museum, where they talk about the people living in secret, preserving their traditions. Mm -hmm. One thing that I cannot find out anywhere is how many of them were actually sincere. You know, did they sincerely convert? Did they still keep some of their traditions? Which yeah. you know, there there are Jewish people today who aren't terribly religious, but still still have the have the keep the ethics and keep keep the certain traditions. The yeah. certain traditions. You know, this is not clear to this day how many were sincere, how many were what was going on. Yeah, but. Um, so those those are some of the positive and the negative aspects of the Reconquista. But, uh, it did get worse because eventually they did say that uh, those Jews who were converted were mm -hmm. known as Moranos. They were right. Christians. They were called Moranos. Moranos was, was Spanish for pigs. Yes. Yeah. So um, and the uh, Muslims who converted were known as Moriscos, mm -hmm. which is, sounds like seafood, but no, it's Morisco. Moriscos. And yeah. eventually they were both ordered out. But within a hundred years of all of this going on, you've got Diego Velasquez, you've got Miguel de Cervantes, you've mm -hmm. got this art flowering out of this unified country. Right. So we've got some positive aspects. Right. So you do have a handful of positive aspects. You've got some really ugly aspects. But what they ended was, in many ways, an extremely vibrant culture. Now, what's interesting now is that the the Spanish love these places, um, and tourists come to see them, flock to see them, mob to see these incredible pieces of art. And it has been a, in some ways, there has been a danger of people overestimating uh, the value of this peaceful time of the golden age uh, of the Islamic rulers. Now, when in we started Spain. this discussion, when we started this research, I was under the impression that it had been this this time of cooperation between Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and that the Christians had wrecked all that. And the research did not bear that out. No, no. Uh, it it there was always this little bit of strife underneath. It was never this pristine time that happened. Um, part of the problem was we had this concept from 
believe it or not, the Romantic era, the early part of the 19th century of people going to these sites that were still there and, and coming up with these visions uh, of how beautiful this area was and talking about uh, these wonders of these ancient Moors. And this is kind of just from looking at the art, but not really understanding uh, what's going on. One of the, one of the most important people who talked about this was a, was an American, a fellow by the name of Washington Irving. Yeah. The guy who wrote Rip Van Winkle, he had <laughs> been the ambassador to Spain under Andrew Jackson. Uh, and he took a trip to the Alhambra, uh, and spent several days there reading about it. And he wrote a book called The Tales of the Alhambra about his time there. Uh, and it's a fascinating piece because he is writing about a place that you can walk into now. And it it is very much the same as what he wrote about it, but he writes about it in an overly romantic sort of way. And, and he takes out the idea of this is a seat of government and a fortress and talks only about harems and, and uh, magic and all of this wonderful stuff that of course is, was there, but was not really the whole he intention created this of this idealistic romantic world that, that, that it's, it's like, this, this other, because it was foreign, it was Let's Stop there. there. Stop there. Let me, he writes, um, under her guidance, he's talking about his guide, and he's stepping for the first time into the Alhambra. Uh, and this is from his book. Under her guidance, we crossed the thresho threshold and were at once transported as if by magic wand into other times and an oriental realm where treading the scenes of Arabian story. Nothing could be greater contrast than the unpromising exterior of the pile with the scene now before us. We found ourselves in a vast patio or court, 150 feet in length, and upwards of 80 feet in breadth, paved with white marble, decorated at each end with light Moorish peristyles, one of which supported an elegant gallery of fretted architecture. Along the moldings of the cornices and on various parts of the walls were estuctions, etuscans, and ciphers, and Cufic and Arabic characters and high relief, repeating the pious mottos of the Muslim monarchs, the builders of the Alhambra, or extolling their grandeur and munif munificence. Along the center of the court extended an immense basin or tank, 124 feet in length, 27 in breadth, and five in depth, receiving its waters from two marble vases. Hence, it's called the court of the Alberca. Great uh, numbers of goldfish were seen gleaming in there. This is, he talks about uh, passing through the court of the, lift, leave that picture there, court of the Alberca. Under a Moorish archway, we entered the renowned court of the lions. No part of the edifice gives a more complete idea of its original beauty than this, for none has suffered so little from the ravages of time. In the center stands the fountain famous in song and story. The alabaster basin still sheds their diamond drops. The 12 lions which support, uh, uh, 12 lions um, which support them and give the court its name still cast forth crystal streams as in the days of Boabdil. The lions, however, are unworthy of their fame, being of miserable sculpture, the work probably of some Christian captive. <laughs> the court is laid out in fire bed, flower beds instead of its ancient and appropriate pavement of tiles or marble. An alteration, an instance of bad taste was made by the French when it in possession of Granada. Round the four sides of the court are the light Ar Arabian arcades of open filigree work supported by slender pillars of white marble, uh, which is supposedly originally gilded. The architecture, like that of most parts of the interior of the palace, is characterized by elegance rather than grandeur, bespeaking a delicate and graceful taste and a disposition of indolent enjoyment. I love that. Indolent 
enjoyment. The idea that all these people did was lie around all day. So, so we this is this, this is fantasy. written. Yeah, he create he helps to create this fantasy. Uh, there will be a uh, uh, specialist in Islamic studies in the 1970s, I believe. His name was Edward Said, and he will call this Orientalism. He'll write a very important book about how the West conceives the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and explaining how we look through eyes of people who do not clearly do not understand what is going on. We only see the surface of what is there and do not understand the the deeper meaning of what's going on. So it's on. kind of a patronizing sort of your it's, cute little people with your cute little it's, customs. Yes, it's, it's extremely patronizing. Um, it doesn't give credit for these people having uh, really um, sincere ideas. And it also emphasizes the most absurd, the most over the top aspects, because no one wants to read a travel log where, you know, the place <laughs> that you're talking about is exactly the same as your neighborhood. So let's build up. But I mean, it is beautiful. Let, yeah. Let's not, not mix that up. But so we had this mythos and some of this is today. And we, of course, we've got the other thing, which says that all Muslims are terrorists, which is right. of course equally nonsense. And I hope we've shown you that there were atrocities committed by Muslims, Christians. Christians. We didn't get into it, but there was a Jewish leader, a Jewish vizier in Cordoba yep. who actually led the attack on Seville and, and ordered the execution of thousands, <laughs> at least hundreds of people. No Being one corrupt and evil is not a matter of religion. It's a matter of who you are. Yeah, honestly. no one has clean hands. Um, the, the, the Christian Spaniards at times created as beautiful of work as the uh, the Muslims in the Iberian Peninsula. But it's still pretty. This once again is inside the uh, that's inside the mesquita, the, 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 at, uh, the Grand Mosque at Cordoba. Yeah, I just um, I just wanted to as we're wrapping up. And it is emphasize. and it is truly breathtaking. And as I said, I love the fact that the Spaniards still love these places. They still uh, are in awe of them, and and they invite people from all over the world to come see them, uh, which is really special. It is really special. It is really amazing, but. So the short of it is, was the Reconquista a good thing or a bad thing? I think it just was. It was a thing. It was a thing. It was a thing. Um, people used religion to justify atrocities at times. They yep. use it to justify kindness, and they tend to do that a lot. Right. Um, but be decent. <laughs> just, just be decent. Don't so, kill people, okay? <laughs> so... We've reconsidered the Reconquista. What's next? What's next? Well, why don't we talk in two weeks? On two the weeks. 30th of January. Right. Let's talk about America. Oh, there? I know there. We can talk about Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall, the great corrupt evil political machine that destroyed lives and ran the government of New York and oppressed people ruthlessly for 70 years. <clears throat> it was the necessary. Uh, the necessary interest group that allowed uh, the uh, immigrants from Ireland, the immigrants from Italy, the immigrants from the Slavic nations to have a voice in American government where they would have been shut out had they not had Tammany Hall. Sounds like an interesting discussion. Sounds sounds like sounds a discussion like we're talking we can about have. Religion again, too, oh, because no, the no, people no, of Tammany no, no. were all Catholics, and the government uh, was all Protestant. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, so we're going to call it a night. We're going to thank you very much for listening. We invite you to leave comments, tell us what you like, tell us what you don't like, and uh, don't kill people, please. Yeah. Thanks. Take care. <laughs>